friends or Warami Gamarada. My name is Nicole Forsyth and I'm a sessional uh, lecturer at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, the University of Sydney, in a very interesting small division called the Historical Performance Division. I'd like to start today and firstly acknowledge the land on which Sydney University teaches and learns. It's the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation's own lands and I'd like to acknowledge the Elders past, present and emerging and their strength and resilience in this place. It's also important to acknowledge the past because our division particularly is really interested in the past, in how people played music, how people learnt music, what sort of instruments the music was performed on how those people lived and how they wrote the music in those times that went before. We're called the Historical Performance Division these days because we are historically informed performers. So we're like, I guess you could call us, curious time-travelling detectives. Um, we're also public and social historians, we're archaeologists and we're also heritage experts. We use things like the instruments of the past, we use things like first and second source um, histories. So a second source history might be something like this, a big textbook. A first source history might be something like a treatise, like a how-to manual of how to play the viola in the past. I play historic viola and historic violin, but I also play modern viola and modern violin as well. So as a time travelling musical detective, what sounds different about this? This is my modern viola playing the same passage. <laughs> That's right, it's higher in pitch, isn't it? What's the difference? Can you see? On my modern viola, modern string instruments have a chin rest, a shoulder rest, we have fine tuners, we have metal strings, and our bows are fairly the same end to end in terms of producing a sound. It has what we call a ferrule on the frog and it looks convex. Have a look at my old viola again and have another listen. I don't have a chin rest. I don't have a shoulder rest. It sounds lower and I'm playing, I don't know, maybe you can see that, on the top two strings which are open gut, not cat gut, made of sheep's intestines or beef intestine and the bottom two strings are silver covered gut as well. So they're all natural materials. The bow, on the other hand, have a look at the shape. So it's convex this time. It has an open frog, no ferrule, and it makes the best and biggest sound at the bottom and tails off towards the top. Oh, and I'm holding it differently too. I don't have anything to put my chin on anymore. So I guess you could call me a heritage expert in the way that I look after my instrument, way that I play. You could call us archaeologists in terms of the treaties or the how-to manuals we use to work out how to play and the books we read and you could call us public and social historians as well looking at the society that surrounds how the musicians played and how the composers composed. Um, the types of questions we like to ask include Things like what sort of instruments or tools did people use to create the music? What sort of instruction manuals, like a recipe? What did they what did they read? What kind of everyday world surrounding these people was, was there? Did it have a clock? Maybe it didn't. Maybe it was run by the church bells in the town 
and maybe that church also had its own organ which had its own pitch which was different to the next town along. So you can see how the society really affects the music as well. You might like to study in the HP division if you're curious about all these things. Um, you could be also interested in studying history or museum studies or heritage studies, archaeology, sociology, maybe musicology as well. And you can combine all these things as a historically informed performer. Um, we used to call ourselves early musicians, but we're not necessarily early because some of the things that we like to explore now in the past are actually mid 20th century now. So how did um, how did Bartok sound, for instance, when he was first performed? Or to be really curious about another society, how did music sound when Chairman Mao first came to power in China? Um, so you can see we're not all not always looking at Western European music either. We've got space to look at other societies and other sorts of music as well. If you're interested in Chinese classical music or Indian classical music of the courts of the past in those places, this might be the division for you to come and study in at Sydney Conservatorium of Music. We're talking about using the tools of the past to the present. At the bottom, we have a Baroque bow of about 1780, um, made in Italy. This one's a copy down here, and you can see that it has a kind of dart shape, so it gets smaller towards the tip. And at the bottom, it has an open frog and much less hair in it than the transitional or classical bow above it, which is starting to look a little bit more like a modern bow. It has a more convex shape, but it still has a nice open frog here. It starts to have a little bit more hair too. This is based on a bow of 1791, so the year Mozart died, and it's a classical or transitional bow, whereas above is what we call a modern bow today, which came into use in the mid-19th century, and you can see it has a nice convex shape, long bow hair, and a big closed frog with a ferrule for all those beautiful attacking sounds that you can make. So there are the three bows in comparison. I will say farewell now. Thank you very much for listening. And we're going to end with a little bit of another spot the difference comparison. Have another listen.